Consistency is one of the most important factors, one of the most important qualities we have to develop in the practice. It's not just a matter of reading a few books and getting a few ideas, or having a few nice meditations every now and then. It's the ability to stick with the practice, moment by moment by moment, breath by breath. So that it can build up a momentum. And that you can develop expertise. And this requires commitment. The quality called truthfulness, satya. In other words, you make up your mind, you're going to stick with the practice. And then you hold true to that intention. You don't let other things waylay you. If other duties come up in the course of the day, you try to figure out a way to stick with the practice of training the mind, regardless of what your duties are. No matter how urgent they may be, how much energy they may take, you've got to find some way of rationing your energy. So you always have at least part of the mind with the breath, with a sense of energy in the body. And you learn to withstand any other thoughts that come up and pull you away. That's the only way progress can happen. They've done that study that people who become expert at a particular physical skill require a certain amount of hours. I've forgotten the exact number. And it's partly the hours, but it's also part, partly your powers of observation and the consistency of the hours. Because the whole point of consistency is you begin to notice things that you wouldn't notice otherwise. If you have a benchmark against which you can measure things, you begin to see when, say, when the water is rising, when the water is falling, when the results are going well, when they're not going well. If you only check in every now and then, it's hard to develop that kind of sensitivity. And if you've ever mastered a particular skill, like a musical instrument or carpentry, a sport, you realize it's not just the number of hours, it's also the amount of observation, your powers of observation that you bring to it. You really want to notice things. That's another quality that's truthfulness, is really looking at what you're doing, gauging the results of what you've done and seeing how you can do it more efficiently. So, for instance, when you notice that the mind is wanted off, you learn how to bring it back more effectively. If you find that you're punishing yourself every time you bring it back, try to find another way that makes it more welcoming to come back, more welcoming to stick with the meditation. But it's this process of consistency that allows you to see the subtleties of what's going on in the mind. So otherwise, you, you're with it for a while, and then you throw it away, and then you come back, and then you have to re-familiarize yourself with the territory. And it happens again and again and again. Progress is slow. What you observe is pretty catch as catch can. It's like watching a TV series where you miss a couple of the episodes, and you have to guess at what happened. Of course, with TV, TV series, they try to make it easy for people who've missed. The breath isn't trying to make it easy for you. The mind isn't trying to make it easy for you. So you really have to be consistent. Because the mind does have this tendency to, to fool itself, to insist that nothing's going wrong, everything's fine, everything is open and above board. 
when it's not. There's that old belief that if you're with somebody and you're not sure whether it's a real person or a ghost or something, you look into a mirror, because mirrors don't reflect ghosts. You can use that as an analogy for the defilements in the mind. It's very hard to catch your side of your own defilements. You look at yourself and they just disappear. They're not there. Or so you think. To catch sight of them, you have to look very steadily, very consistently, to see where you're giving into your pride or into your laziness or into your anger or into your frustration or whatever. And the course of sticking with the meditation will bring up issues. And it's your willingness to stick with the practice even when the issues get brought up. That's what is the mark of a real meditator. For instance, boredom comes up. What is boredom? It's partly your desire to be entertained all the time, your desire for change. But sometimes it's the, the way the mind reacts when something is about to stir inside, and it doesn't want to admit to itself, say, that there's an unskillful emotion or an unskillful motivation going on. So boredom is a kind of distraction, and it's a kind of heedlessness. The idea that I need to be entertained, rather than thinking, well, what are we here for? We're here to keep developing skillful qualities and trying to uncover unskillful ones. That's part of it. And the other part is, as I just said, it's this unwillingness to look at your own unskillful motivations. And so the boredom points your attention someplace else. So it may be a tough slog, but stick with the boredom and watch it for a while. If you're feeling bored, take it as a sign you're not looking carefully enough, because there are interesting things going on all the time. The process of becoming is taking place all the time in the mind. And it's an intricate process. And it's a means by which you're causing yourself stress and suffering. These are all things that are really worth knowing, really worth looking into. And whether you like what you see about yourself as you look, you've got to learn how to put that aside. This is one of the meanings of that old Zen statement that the great way is easy for people with no preferences. We prefer to see the good things about ourselves, and we prefer not to see bad things about ourselves. But if you're going to learn how to prevent unskillful states from arising and do away with the ones that are already there, you have to be willing to admit to yourself that there are unskillful, unskillful emotions going on. And when you're up for whatever comes up, you don't allow yourself to get deflected Start focusing on what's wrong with other people, what's wrong with the situation, what's wrong with this or that. We're not here to straighten out the situation, we're here to straighten out ourselves. And when you can keep that focus consistent, okay, that's when you're really on the path. Because you look at all those eightfold factors that we're just chanting right now. Right view is about how you're creating stress and suffering, how you can put an end to it. Right resolve is about the quality of your intentions. What do you really want? Right speech, right action, right livelihood, right mindfulness, right effort, right concentration. These are all about you. Ways of looking at yourself, measuring yourself. Do you measure up? What inside you doesn't measure up? And if you really want to master these skills, you have to be willing to look at the areas where the mind just really doesn't measure up yet. Not take it as a reflection on you, but simply see it as actions. As the Buddha said, we're trying to find purity in our actions. It's not so much self-help as 
is it is action help, help in our words, help in our deeds, help in our thoughts, purifying our words and deeds and thoughts, learning to look at them as activities and not cling to them so much. And this sort of the kind of dishonesty that goes on with clinging to things that we know are unskillful. And yet not willing to admit that they're there. It's a strange thing. We cling to them, but we don't admit that they're there. That's a lot of what ignorance is, and that's a lot of what we've got to learn how to see through. And part of the seeing through is learning how to stick consistently with the breath every time it comes in, every time it goes out, and noticing what's going on in the mind at the same time. And John Lee makes the point that when you're with the breath, all four frames of reference are right there. You're going to see the breath, but you're also going to see feelings. You're going to see mind states, and you're going to see mental qualities as these things hover around the breath. And so it's only to be expected that as you're watching the breath, unskillful mind states are going to arise, unpleasant feelings are going to arise, and the skill lies in learning how to deal with them so you're not knocked off course. This is why John Lee gives so many instructions on how to develop a sense of pleasure. You're not just watching things arising willy-nilly. Willy actually actively trying to cultivate a way of breathing that gives rise to pleasure, gives rise to a sense of fullness, rapture, refreshment, to make it easier to stay with the breath. And to notice what kind of mind states are coming up. And as long as the breath is comfortable, it's easier to withstand the pull of the unskillful mind states and to nourish the skillful ones. You take the breath as your ally. You take these feelings of pleasure as your ally. So you can do what's needed to get past the unskillful mental qualities and develop the skillful ones. And part of it means admitting that the unskillful ones are there and recognizing them as unskillful realizing you've got to do something about them. So even though we may tend to blame the situation outside for the fact that we can't keep the practice going continually, that may be partly true, but what you can really do something about is what you can is the problems in the mind that are keeping it from being consistent. And the first step lies in admitting that there are problems in the mind, and you really want to do something about them. And you're willing to take whatever steps are necessary and stick with the practice no matter what. Because you are choosing sides. Do you want to choose these mental states? They're really deep down you know are unskillful. Or do you want to look for something better? It's a choice we're making all the time, moment by moment, breath by breath. So do what you can to keep the choices right each time you breathe in, each time you breathe out. Because what the Buddha taught really is special. It is possible to transform all these unskillful mental activities into more skillful ones. It's possible to transcend the day-to-day -day sufferings that we keep creating for ourselves. It's not just a matter of learning how to live with our unskillful mental qualities, you really can uproot them 
That's the promise the Buddha made. And all of his noble disciples have said, yes, it's true. But it's not going to be true for us unless we're true in the practice. That's the quality that makes all the difference. <laughs>